Well, good morning. The province's road network is in a sad state of repair. There is not enough money being spent to maintain the infrastructure. The province's economy is suffering as a result. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, I'm not talking about the current state of our roads and bridges, although I could be. No, I'm talking about the year 1894, when a group of visionary Ontarians got together and established an Ontario chapter of the Good Roads Movement. These were local politicians, farmers who wanted better roads to get their produce to market, and believe it or not, cyclists who were tired of the bone-jarring ride of corduroy roads or getting to their destination covered in mud. The Good Roads Movement started in the United States, and while many state and provincial associations have disappeared, the Ontario Good Roads Association is still going strong. In 1901, the Good Roads train traveled across Ontario, teaching the latest in road building innovations. To this day, education and training is at the fore of OGRA's activities, training close to 3,000 public works officials and politicians a year in all aspects of road design, construction and maintenance, and asset management. The Good Roads Movement was always about influencing public policy, and in the 80s, OGRA expanded its role by adding a manager of policy. We now pride ourselves on our annual advocacy day and a review of legislation to ensure our members' input is heard. Add to that our suite of software applications, our cutting edge research, and I think you will agree that in this, our 125th year, the Good Roads Movement is alive and well in Ontario. Please enjoy this brief slideshow chronicling OGRA's last 125 years.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm uh, happy to say uh, with me on stage is our current board of directors, several of our past presidents, and our honorary life members. These individuals, along with our dedicated staff, are the reason that OJRA is a strong, vital association with a promising future. Please join me in thanking them for their service. Now I'd ask that you please rise for the playing of the national anthem. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Good morning. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Traney. I'm uh, the county engineer for Middlesex County, and I'm currently your OJRA president. As the president, I wanted to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishawabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Matisse peoples. As an organization, we remain committed to fulfilling our role in Canada's reconciliation with Indigenous Canadians. On behalf of the Board of Directors and staff, I want to welcome you to the 2019 conference. Not only is this our 125th anniversary, but it's the first time we have not held this conference at the Fairmont Royal York Hotel in a very long time. We had to take leave of the Fairmont while it's being renovated. The conference is spread out over several floors, and finding the right room might be confusing. To assist you in finding your way, please look for our conference ambassadors. They will be wearing bright orange safety vests, courtesy of AGO, and holding signs. Looking very much like flag persons, they can help you find your way. We are very pleased that uh, 880 municipal delegates have chosen to attend OJRA 2019, and we don't think you'll be disappointed. The OJRA Board of Directors sincerely believes that this year's conference has something for everyone. Consult your smartphone app for the latest and always up-to-date information. We have some great plenary sessions that will be informative, and the selection of 15 concurrent workshops will make it tough for you to decide what sessions to attend. Building on the success of last year, we are once again offering six technical briefing sessions. And if that's not enough, our shift disturbers will be sure to pique your interest with their short but insightful talks. We have over 100 exhibitors with us this week who are excited to meet you. Take some time during the next two days to visit them and learn what they have to offer. While you're in the exhibit hall, look for the VRcade. Try your skill on one of the many driving simulators provided by DriveWise Canada. Also, be sure to check out Asset Management Central. We have brought several agencies together in one area that specialize in asset management. Nowhere else will you find that much expertise in one space. The charging station for your smartphones and other devices can be found just outside the exhibit area. It's lockable and secure for that quick charge. I want to thank the Ontario Asphalt Pavement Council for sponsoring and running the technical session on how to get more durable pavements. For the fifth year, we also held the Emerging Municipal Leaders Forum sponsored by Municipal World. 
With our aging population, the gray wave will soon be transitioning out of the workforce, leaving a huge knowledge vacuum. We, have, we had over 100 students from across the province learning about the important work that municipalities do, and who knows, some of these bright young minds may be working for your municipality someday. Finally, you'll want to stick around Wednesday for the session on joint and several liability. We have assembled a unique panel consisting of an insurance industry expert, a solicitor who defends municipalities, and a solicitor who represents the Trial Lawyers Association. We are looking forward to this session as we prepare for the public consultation as promised by the Premier of Ontario. I would dare say that this is the boldest program we have ever offered. It's truly jam-packed, one we believe will be sure to please. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our sponsors. Of course, without their support, OGRA could not put on such a great conference. We would also not be able to do a lot of the things we do for you over the course of the year. All of our sponsors are listed in your program. However, I would like to take uh, a moment to specifically mention the following sponsors. Uh, Frank Cowan Company Limited, Marmec Technologies, the Municipal Engineers Association, Municipal World, and the Salt Institute. Their participation and financial support to this conference is truly appreciated. So before we move on to our first session this morning, there's a few housekeeping matters. Uh, as a courtesy to our speakers throughout the conference, please uh, silence your smartphones. If you'd like to attend the OJRA Awards Luncheon that's happening tomorrow, you can still purchase tickets at the registration area that's up on the concourse level until 4.30 today. Uh, please also plan to join one of our sponsors, Frank Cowan Company Limited, for the Welcome Exchange Reception on Tuesday afternoon. This is a great networking opportunity for you before you head out to your dinners. Your name badge is your admission to all sessions and workshops and should be worn at all times. Only delegates wearing official conference badges will be allowed entry into all sessions. We would also draw your attention to the form printed on gray paper which was given to you at registration. Our final world word panel of municipal experts needs to be put to work. So please put your questions in writing, drop them off at registration before noon tomorrow. Then come out on Wednesday morning and hear the answer or advice on your issues. I would also take a moment to strongly recommend that if you have not done so already to download the conference app. It includes all the conference information you could possibly need and also works offline once it's been downloaded. If you're staying here at the Sheraton and you can get free Wi-Fi in your guest room, all you need to do is sign up for the Merit Rewards program. If you're not staying here, you can access free Wi-Fi on the lobby level. I would now like to call upon Ken Lope, Manager of Road Operations, City of Mississauga, and the Chair of the OGRA Nominating Committee to present the OGRA Nominating Committee report. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to present the report of the OGRA Nominating Committee. Under Section 26 of the Constitution of the Ontario Good Roads Association, the Nominating Committee shall report to the annual conference its slate of 11 directors. The Nominating Committee placed the following names in nomination for a two-year term. From the Northern Zone, we have Cheryl Fort, Mayor of the Township of Horn Payne. From Southwest Zone, we have Kelly Elliott, Deputy Mayor, Municipality of Thames Centre. And we also have John Parsons, Division Manager, Transportation and Roadside Operations from City of London. From the South Central Zone, we have Robin Dunn, CAO of, from the Township of Aro Madante, and also we have Donna Jeb, Councillor, Town of the Tecumseh. The following will also serve on the 2019-2020 OGRA Board of Directors. We have Rick Kester, President and CAO, City of Belleville. Rick, please stand up. Rick. No, he's up. Okay, we also have Rick Harms, First Vice President and Project Engineer for the City of Thunder Bay. Dave Burton, second vice president and mayor, municipality of Highlands East. And we also have uh, Chris Traney, who's our media past president and county engineer, county of Middlesex. And for our, your directors, we have Paul Ainsley, councillor, city of Toronto. Anton Boucher, director of public works and engineering from the municipality of East Ferris. Stephen Kadama, director of transportation services, city of Toronto. We have Brian Lewis, councillor and home of the little NHL, town of Halton Hills. We have Paul Schubman, Mayor, Municipality of St. Charles, and last but not least, Michael Tao, Manager of Operations for the County of Peterborough. The nominating committee circulated its report to the OJRA membership on January 21, 2019 and called for additional nominations. 
No additional nominations were received for the Northern Zone, and therefore, Cheryl Fort, Mayor Township of Hornpain, is declared elected. Congratulations, Mary Fort. One additional nomination was received in both the Southwest and South Central Zones. In the Southwest, we have uh, Frank Kennis, Councillor, Municipality of Strathroy, Caradoc. And from the South Central Zone, we have uh, A. Cash Desi, Deputy Mayor, Municipality of Gray Highlands. As a result, an election will be held tomorrow, Tuesday, February 26, from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. in the VIP room, concourse level. All delegates from member municipalities and First Nations are eligible to vote. Please welcome back to the stage President Chris Traney to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Well, now we're going to get to the good stuff. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome Tom Nichols, a professor at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and the Harvard Extension School. Tom is an expert on Russia and the role that warfare plays in international affairs. With his new book, however, he looks at the idea of expertise itself. In The Death of Expertise, the Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters, Tom argues that too many people have embraced the idea that experts should have no more standing in government or society than they themselves do. This will certainly sound familiar to anyone working for a municipality. He makes the case that experts do matter and that this kind of false ego, <laughs> give me a hard word first thing in the morning, Ega e egalitarianism is dangerous. Tom is also a five-time undefeated Jeopardy! champion who played in, played in both the 1994 Tournament of Champions and the 2005 Ultimate Tournament of Champions. Please join me in welcoming Tom Nichols. Well, good morning. Uh, let me start by, um, uh, first of all, uh, thanking the management um, for Ojera because uh, I snuck in before the storm. Uh, so uh, it was a close call, but I made it. Um, I guess the first question is, why would I do this? Why would I write something with such an obnoxious title? Uh, because we know expertise isn't dead. This whole room is full of experts. Um, we're, we're all masters in, the, in this room and in various walks of life uh, of various areas of expertise. And yet, there's a problem. Um, people seem to rely on expertise, but they don't very much respect it. And the question is whether that's new. And I'm sure you've all dealt with this, that uh, people say, yes, I understand you know, that, you, uh, that you know your job and you know what you're doing, but I was promised elevated highways and flying jet cars, and I'd like to know where they are. Uh, the problem is that I think we've entered a new phase uh, when it comes to expertise. Um, and I'll just hold that map for a moment. Where people don't respect the idea of expertise. They use it, they pull it off the shelf, they uh, expect it to work, but they assume that they themselves are as capable as anyone else of figuring out highly complicated matters. And this isn't true. So let me move to a couple of things here that have me concerned, just to give you some examples before I move on um, of the kind of thing I'm concerned about. The Washington Post asked Americans after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine um, to find Ukraine on a map. And um, they had some pretty strong views on it. Now, as you heard, I, I played Jeopardy. Uh, and this is a great Jeopardy question because Ukraine is actually the largest country whose borders are entirely within Europe. So you could throw a dart at a map and have a pretty good chance here. Um, for those of you that want to know, that's where Ukraine is. And the problem was that people who had the very strongest notions about using force in Ukraine, including deploying NATO troops into Ukraine, were the people who were the least likely to know where it was. And then when told, you know, well, that we political scientists have a term for putting NATO troops in there. It's called World War III. Uh, they would reconsider their ideas. The average respondent was off by an, by an average of 1,800 miles. That means when asked for their views on this, people expressed very strong views while not being able to put this, in some cases, on the right continent. 
Um, that's a problem. But maybe, you know, map tests aren't fair. Any of us in here, I consider myself an expert on international relations, but if you jumped out at me at 9.05 a.m. and handed me a map of Central Europe or uh, Africa and said, find, find a country, I might fail it too. Here's a similar problem. Um, <clears throat> this map that you see behind me, see all these little blue dots that go all the way from the Arabian Peninsula all the way out to Siberia, down to Australia? Every one of these dots is the guess of an American adult about where North Korea is. Now think about that for a second. This is a country that my country and we together as allies may end up facing a nuclear threat from and only about 35% of Americans were able to properly locate this. My favorite part of this map, by the way, are the people who figured out that it's in Korea but put it in the south, even though the word north is, you know, right there in the name of the state, North Korea. But again, you know, life is tough. We're, we have taken a lot of news. People are busy, work, job, kids. So a while back, a uh, polling company decided to see um, a rather mischievous left-leaning polling company said, we're going to prove that Republicans tend to be a little more warlike. So we're going to ask Republicans and Democrats alike how they feel about bombing Agrabah. And as you might expect, Republicans were a little more willing to bomb Agrabah. Um, but they came up with an unexpected finding, which is that Democrats also had very strong feelings about not bombing Agrabah, that they felt very strongly that Agrabah should not be bombed. Agrabah hadn't hurt anybody. Uh, the Republicans felt this was a matter of national security. The Democrats felt that this was just more American muscle flexing. This is Agrabah. If you have small children or grandchildren, Agrabah is the fictional country in Aladdin. And roughly half of the respondents had really strong views about whether or not to bomb a cartoon. <laughs> whether you're making policy at the municipal or provincial level, at the national level, this is a problem. And I've worked at all levels of government. I, I started, I cut my teeth in a mayor's office as a teenager. I worked in state government in Massachusetts for two years, and I was an aide um, in the United States Senate uh, working on foreign policy issues. This is a problem. If people have really strong views about whether or not to bomb Agrippa, uh, policy making becomes a really complicated thing. So why did this happen? What, what spurred me to, to do this? Well, before I get into some specific um, areas here that I think caused this problem, uh, I'll relate to you the thing that um, I think with every book or article, there's always one moment that makes you sit down and angrily pound at the keyboard. And um, it was back during the Edward Snowden business. And um, I had said to some younger people, um, look, you know, this is, I'm a Russia guy. I've been doing this for 30 years. I said, this has got Russia's fingerprints all over it. This isn't a hard call. You know, the guy's in Moscow, his WikiLeaks. So a lot of stuff that five years ago were a little more controversial that today we sort of shrug and accept. And um, finally, a, a younger person said to me, and I never forgot this, Tom, um, I don't think you understand Russia. Let me explain Russia to you. To which I said, ah, no. Uh, and I think this was the phenomenon that made me decide to, to really investigate this as a problem. How many of us have had our own area of expertise explained back to us? Oh, you're an airline pilot? Let me tell you about what it's like. I got some things about weather that I want to talk to you about. Well, do you fly too? No, no, but I, I read some stuff. Um, you're a doctor? Let me tell you about vaccines. Uh, you're a structural engineer? 
Let me explain where you're going wrong with this skyscraper. That's new. People doubting experts or wanting second opinions or wanting more confirmation. That's normal, that's healthy. People saying, you're a dentist? I have some thoughts on crowns. That's new. And I think it's because of uh, an epidemic of narcissism that we are seeing spread throughout several institutions. But let me talk about some more specific issues um, related to the past 40 or 50 years. First, we have to talk about education. I think one of the things that's happened, not just in the United States, I, I was surprised, by the way, I, I wrote this and I thought, well, maybe this is mostly an American thing. I thought when I started writing this that, you know, Americans, um, we have a pretty well-deserved reputation for being obnoxious know-it-alls, and maybe we're just all finally sick of each other. Um, turns out that's not true. Um, I've come and talked many times here in Canada. Uh, the book is now um, translated into 11 languages, which I was a little surprised by, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm gratified, but I'm, I'm a little shocked and I'm a little worried about that. Uh, and so one of the things that I think is common across these cultures is education. We have adopted a therapeutic model of education from kindergarten right through graduate school. We don't ask students, what have you learned? We ask students, how do you feel? Are you happy? Did you enjoy this? How was the course? Um, I, I, I should say I've never had trouble with course evaluations. I've had a 30 plus year record of very successful teaching, but it does rub me the wrong way even now that we ask you know, teenagers. Um, how did you like this course taught by an expert in the field? Almost like um, we're reviewing restaurants. How, how was the comparative religions course? A little salty? Uh, did you like the math course? Too much jalapeno? Um, and we do this in part because we have overly empowered the notion of students as clients, um, as customers who are always right, or as very fragile dolls who, who can be broken too easily. I think children and young people are more resilient than that, but we've created a habit in them of resisting learning because we are all, always telling them that, they are, that their views are right and reasonable and valued, uh, and education doesn't work that way. I, I uh, miss the days, my first day in graduate school, I had this um, very imposing Jesuit philosophy professor and he was like right out of central casting, you know, black horn room glasses, steel buzz cut. And uh, he handed out an essay on the first day of class called What a Student Owes to a Teacher. Imagine trying to do that today. Imagine taking a bunch of students and saying, here's an essay that I wrote on what you owe me, including your trust and humility and docility. Um, I, I got an A in that class after um, patiently, like all good young people would, after I patiently explained to him uh, Plato, um, which he had read in the ancient Greek for most of his life and I had just encountered that year. Uh, but I got an A and I walked up to him at the uh, Christmas party at Georgetown University and I said, Merry Christmas, Father, what do you say? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And in a moment that was very important to my further intellectual development, he looked at me over his glasses and he said, what I say to you, Mr. Nichols, is repent. <laughs> um, so I think we spend too much time uh, talking about feelings instead of facts. Uh, we spend too much time on the kind of therapeutic aspects of education. And I think this undermines the creation of habits of critical thinking and lifelong learning. There's also the problem of media. You'll notice, by the way, I'm leaving the internet for last because I don't think the internet is what caused this. I think the internet put it on steroids. There's also the problem of media. Now, when I was a kid, um, the evening news was a half hour. Uh, uh, younger students, by the way, are always amazed when I try to explain to them that uh, the evening news before the Vietnam War was 15 minutes long. They, they're shocked by this. Um, but I, I don't think that those were better days. I mean, 
you know, the 1960s and 70s, uh, the news in the United States was three old white guys reading curated streams of corporate approved information from New York City. Fair enough. But it also meant that there were editorial decisions that said that an arms control treaty was more important than which Kardashian was sleeping with whom. Somewhere after that, we developed enough bandwidth and enough options, particularly through cable, to create multiple information streams. And the good side of this is that we now get a much more diverse set of views. We hear from people of different ages, different ethnic and regional backgrounds, different political views. The downside is that because there are so many of these options, you can spend all day watching the news, in theory watching the news, and not learn anything, and never, more to the point, never encounter a view that you don't happen to like. If you want to watch an entire evening's worth of news and never be challenged to hear something you disagree with, that is completely possible in the 21st century. And that's, that's, that's a problem, because we are now, <coughs> excuse me, we are now curating our own information streams to make us feel smarter about ourselves, because the whole business has become, the whole business of media has become a giant exercise in confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the search for information you already agree with, because it feels good to be right. We, we know this now, we know this through re research. It physically feels good to be right about things. When someone says to you, you say, I think X, and someone walks up to you and says, you know what, you're right. And you, you get a little jolt and you say, wow, that felt great. Um, and so we do that all night long. We don't really, we have these kind of fake wrestling matches on the evening news where we all shout at each other. And I have been on all the networks, I've been part of that, I, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody else. Um, but we don't really force people to engage with information and to learn anything or to challenge their own views. And that is in part because of this stovepiping of political views through media, um, but also because of the amount of information that um, ha is out there. And because we're in a 24-7 news cycle, we're just pumping that information and, and then dragging the bottom of the barrel uh, every day just to find more things to say. Um, I've actually had producers call me up and say, uh, listen, can you come and do a segment for us on, you know, uh, pickle manufacturing? And I'm like, I, I don't know anything about that. And literally this happened, a producer said to me, come on, it's five minutes. And I said, it would be five minutes of unadulterated ignorance. I don't know anything about this. And there was this kind of silence, and she said, thank you for being honest. Uh, because, you know, people want to go on TV. So come on on TV and talk about something. And so we have lots of folks trying to fill endless amounts of air time, blathering nonsense, and mostly trying to pitch it to what they think the show has already asked them to talk about. Um, there have been one or two cases, I've had mostly good experiences with media, but there have been one or two cases where People have called me up and said, what do you think about issue X? And I say, well, I don't think it's something to be that angry about. And they say, okay, thanks, we, we won't use you today. Um, the um, problem of Googling and as doctors call it, calling Dr. Google the internet, I, I left this for last because when I started writing this, people would say, it's the internet, right? Like the internet is all making us crazy. And yes, the internet, I, I am not a technophobe. Um, if there are younger folks in here, um, I, I'm even a computer gamer going back to the 80s and 90s. I've built some of my own rigs. I mean, I really love technology and I really love computers. Um, I still remember the thrill, as some of us in here may, of, you know, putting that, that haze modem on your desk and hooking it up to your phone and then it would make that god-awful sound you know, the, the sound of internet freedom, right? That, you know, to make this thing. And I was like, wow, that's just the coolest thing I've ever done. Um, but the internet has had a dark side. 
which is that has made us all insufferable to each other. Um, do you all remember the, um, the American television show Cheers back in the 80s? It was about a bunch of Boston bar flies. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, so uh, I was required to love it. Um, th there was a character in it named Cliff, the mailman. And, and Cliff would sit down at the end of the bar, and he'd, and he'd always say something unbelievably stupid. And it would always begin with, well, uh, it's a known fact. Or uh, studies have shown. And it was, then whatever followed was complete nonsense. My, my favorite is when someone asked him what DNA, they're talking about men and women having fights, and he said, well, uh, it's a well-known fact. DNA stands for dames are not aggressive. Uh, and, and, you know, that every bar, every neighborhood has that. But because of this, because of one of these, we are all cliff now. We're all in the bar going, well, uh, excuse me, but uh, it's a known fact right here. And of course, the problem is that we don't know what we're looking at most of the time. Um, students in particular are, 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 I think it's very dangerous. Well, first of all, the people who don't understand the internet are us, people that are over 55 or 60. Um, Facebook um, is highly dangerous for older folks because they have, they have a tendency not to be very adept with new media. But younger people um, make a different mistake. They assume that everything that's on the internet is there by an act of God. They assume that uh, information grows on the internet because um, facts fell from the sky like heaven droppeth uh, rain upon the fields. They don't understand that the internet is not a library. I can't tell you how many times younger people have said to me, well, the internet's just a big library. And I'm like, no, the internet's a big dumpster. Um, now, if you dumpster dive behind a really good restaurant, you might well find a, a crepe, you know, or, or uh, some leftover uh, canopies. You know, it can happen. But by and large, you know, if you dumpster dive, you will find garbage. Um, there's about a hundred, um, there's about a billion websites now. Going on the rule that, um, I talk about this in the book, the rule coined by the 1950s science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon, that 90% of everything is crap, that means there's about 900 million bad websites. That still leaves 100 million really good websites, but the problem is that the internet has no editor. It has no gatekeeper. It has nobody to tell you where the good information or the bad information is. The, the web page of a Nobel Prize winner can sit right next to some propaganda from ISIS. Um, somebody who's trying to sell soup could be right next to the Mayo Clinic. And there's no way for you to tell. Uh, I, I had a blog uh, for a few years. I used to blog, and you know, I took it down. I took it down. I realized I was becoming part of the problem. And I tell my students, you know, they said, why'd you take your blog down? And they said, oh, can I, I read something on your blog, can I quote it? And I'd say, no, the editor of that thing is an idiot. <laughs> and, and it would take them a second to say, but the editor, the editor, there's no, there's, oh, oh. I say, look, every, I tell the students, I teach a writing course at the Harvard Extension School, and I say, everybody needs an editor. Hey, Tiger Woods has a golf coach. Even, you know, published authors need an editor. And I took it down because I thought it was just um, irresponsible. And uh, I think the golden age of blogs is fading out, but I, I think that that was um, a you know, serious problem because there's, there's no quality control, there's no content control. And so if you really want to think that Barack Obama was born in Africa, if you ask the internet enough times, it's going to tell you yes. If you think Donald Trump is a lizard person sent here to steal our water, Somewhere there's a website that will tell you that. You know, I used to joke about this and say, well, if you want to believe Hillary Clinton was running a, you know, child sex ring out of a pizza joint, problem is there is a website that says that and people took it seriously and showed up with guns. Um, and so the internet, I think, took this problem that I would, as a kind of good moderate New England conservative, I, I blame all bad things on the 60s. Uh, I would say that, 
Um, this, this began in the late 60s and then really blossomed during the me decade uh, to where people decided I'm as smart as experts. Now, I have to say a few things about the failures of experts because they are manifest and they are real. And I think the collapse of expertise or the, or the collapse of faith in expertise tracks pretty closely with the collapse in the faith of the average person in government, in institutions. Um, I grew up in the generation, I was almost nine years old when the United States landed on the moon. So I come from this generation of children that say, we landed on the moon, how hard can anything be? You know, I mean, by the, by the time I was a young kid, I still remember thinking it was kind of the height of American um, you know, spiking the ball uh, to have Commander Bean on the moon hitting a golf ball off the lunar surface, right? That was almost like a, you know, um, look, how, look at where we've gotten that we're so bored with going to the moon that I'm playing golf up here. Um, but that period was followed very quickly by the end of the Vietnam War, America's loss, Watergate, revelations about abuses of the intelligence community, things that made people say, hey, the guys that sent people to the moon might not be that trustworthy. And maybe they're not even that smart. Um, maybe, you know, maybe there's something going wrong here behind the scenes that I'm not aware of. Now, I, I do push back on some of um, what people throw at me these days as expert failure. When I started writing this book, I always got um, the whole, what was, I called the holy trinity of expert failure. People say, thalidomide, Vietnam, challenger. Um, which I think shows you how much people have got, just taken it for granted that everything in the modern world works. That you know, Challenger as a, the the space shuttle accidents as cases of expert failure. It's hard to go into space. It's a spaceship. It's hazardous. It shows you how used to things working people have become. That if a spaceship has a critical failure, people think experts don't know what they're doing. Um, Thalidomide it tells you something about how safe drugs are. I actually had my research assistant go look this up um, because thalidomide was before I was born, and yet people still remember it. Meanwhile, it turns out that the number of safe over-the-counter drugs people in the West take, something on the order of 300,000 perfectly safe non-prescription medications of various kinds, uh, and we don't even think about it. When it comes to foreign policy, and where politics and expertise intersect, which is, I think, where a lot of folks in this room live as well, then it becomes a problem because the public does not really distinguish very well between experts who advise and the elites who decide. I used to tell them, I, went to, I worked in the Senate during the first Gulf War, and I said, look, I was the expert, the senator was the elite. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I was a, you know, 30-year-old legislative assistant, um, you know, with a badge, uh, and I was, you know, if, if having a parking spot on Capitol Hill, which I thought was really cool, uh, you know, so I, if that makes me elite, fine. I was, I, I could park on First Street on Capitol Hill, so I was like the in crowd. My boss, who was a God rest his soul, a billionaire senator, I would argue he was more elite than I was because he had to stand up and cast votes. And I think that one of the things that's happened in the 21st century is that increasingly the public wants things that are difficult to do and contradictory and they send that to their elected officials and then say, if you can't figure this out, it's because experts are stupid. And the example of this, at least in the United States, that makes me crazy, are the people who call their congressmen and say, I want to repeal Obamacare, but I want you to keep the Affordable Care Act. There is a significant number of people in the United States who genuinely don't understand that those are two different things and that they actually want one repealed and one kept. 
Um, in the book, I talk about uh, foreign aid, which in the United States is always this big um, hullabaloo about how much money we're spending on foreign aid. And if you ask the average American, you'll get a num number somewhere around 10 to 25 percent of the budget. The average American thinks we're spending about 10 to 25 percent of the budget on foreign aid. If you ask about 5 to 10 percent, there's actually a very small minority, about 1 in 10, 1 in 9, who think that 50 percent of the U.S. budget is being spent on foreign aid. The actual number is less than 1 percent. It's about three quarters of 1 percent. That's how far off the average person in my country is about how much we spend on foreign aid. I don't know what elected officials are supposed to do with that. I also don't know what elected officials are supposed to do with things that the public really wants that aren't good for them. Um, there, you know, econ bankers in 2007 were telling people to buy houses they couldn't afford. That's what bankers do. Lexus salesmen do not tell you not to buy a Lexus. <laughs> Uh, economists were saying, this is getting pretty dangerous. This is a bad idea. And yet, if you talk to the average American about the bank failure, about the, the recession in 2008, they will tell you that this was an expert failure, none of the smart people saw it coming, uh, and that no one could have possibly known it, and this was just greedy um, economists uh, trying to plunder the economy, when in fact, professional economists were the people saying, this is, this is not a good idea. Um, the Gulf War is often brought up, the second Gulf War. N not, a, not a shining moment for military planning in the United States, but it was not an unpopular war either. Uh, and so we're, I think we're having, this is starting to bleed over, and I'll talk about this a little bit toward the end, and then um, hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion before we break. Um, that there are a lot of things that the public has demanded, told experts and the people they advise to make happen, and then later said, um, I, I, don't like, I don't like this, this cake that I told you to bake. Um, which is not to say there aren't real expert failures. Experts are human beings. We, we not, not me, of course. They lie, uh, falsify, obfuscate, uh, spin. All of those things happen. There's no doubt about it. Experts make mistakes. Uh, and engage in the full range of human sin and, and vice like everybody else. I would argue, as, and, I, and I, the, the simplest expression I use about this is expert aren't, experts aren't always right. They're just more likely to be right than you are. They will make mistakes and they check on each other. When students ask me, what should I read for a newspaper? I always say, anything that has a corrections section. A newspaper that does not have a corrections column is not a newspaper. Um, uh, and, uh, what we've, they're right now, um, some of the scientific journals in America are in the midst of what their critics call a retraction crisis because they're looking back now at some of the studies, double checking them, and they're retracting the bad ones. I, I would argue this is how the system works. A, a journal that never retracts an article is probably not doing its job. Uh, but again, we just expect these things to work. We hit send on an email, and we have no idea how much effort was involved among everybody from engineers to diplomats to, to local planners to make that email go. We turn on our taps, and we expect perfectly clean water every time. We get in an airplane, and we expect that the air traffic control system just works. We pull out a, a, a passport and we expect that it's recognized. Um, <clears throat> I've been throwing around this word expert, so let me say a couple of quick words about who I think an expert is, because a lot of times um, the public will push back on this word and say, well, you mean people like you, pointy-headed, you know, uh, ivory tower guys with PhDs, and I don't mean that at all. Um, education is important, but so is training, depending on what your field is. Credentials matter because I do think it's important, um, especially for, for folks here who deal with things like public and civic engineering projects. You want an engineer who's been examined by other engineers. Um, you don't want a guy who says, uh, listen, I'm gonna, I've got an idea for an elevated highway here, and I've read some things, and I've taken a look at the internet, and I think I got this. 
Um, you want some peer affirmation and review. You want people that have experience, although you know, experience is always an interesting uh, problem. Younger people always bristle when I start talking like my dad and I say, look, it takes about 20 years to get two decades of experience. And they go, oh, you know, you sound like my dad. I'm like, yes, everyone sounds like, sooner or later you will sound like your dad too. Um, but, you know, if I fell off this stage uh, and we needed a doctor, um, if there's an EMT here, that'd be great. If there's a new medical, a new MD, that'd be better. If the head of orthopedic surgery at a local hospital is here, I'll take that guy. What I don't want is the guy who says, I uh, was watching an episode of ER the other night. <laughs> no, you know, maybe not. <coughs> so, <clears throat> I think that this is um, something that goes across professions and trades. I had a house fire about a year ago. And, um, you know, as you know, my specialization is in Russia, nuclear weapons, arms control. My house was full of experts, electricians, plumbers, contractors. I was completely useless. I was walking, they kept pushing me out of the way. And I literally was like a step away from like, hey, um, Anybody needs to know about, you know, intermediate range nuclear missiles? And they're like, yeah, I'm the guy. Everybody else, I'm like, thanks. Actually, uh, this true story, um, there was a guy painting, and um, uh, I, I love telling this story because his name is Big Jim. He paints without a ladder. He's one of those guys, just stands there and goes. And um, he said, all right, so uh, look, Mr. Nichols, I'm going to put some primer, and then I've got this stuff, and it's, and I said, Jim, I don't understand a word of this. I said, words, 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 paint, right? And, and he said, yes. I said, is it the right stuff? Will it take care of this money? He said, yes. I said, great. I said, listen, you need to know about nuclear weapons. I'm your man. But the rest of it, I don't know. And he stopped for a moment and he said, so what is going to happen in North Korea? And I thought, finally, a question I could answer. And I said, well, here's what I think is going to happen. Um, this was, you know, during going up to this first summit. I said, well, here's what I think is going to happen. And I'm, you know, I'm concerned. And that's what I think it means. And he kind of nodded. And he said, okay, thanks. He picked up the paint. He started paint. Two experts had a conversation, stayed out of each other's way. I have a beautifully painted house that doesn't smell like smoke anymore. And he feels like he's a little more up to date on what's happening with North Korea. I didn't tell him how to paint a house. And I think we need to respect that division of labor. We need to start doing that more. Because there is a crisis in our society, and I say our, in the advanced industrialized world of experts not, and the public not getting along with each other and not listening to, other, to each other and not respecting each other. Look, this is how we see ourselves. This is how experts love to see themselves, right? We're teachers. We're the... We're the, the tough taskmaster teaching to play the drums. We're the people on TV. That's my, that's my serious face. This is my TV. I'm being very serious face. Um, you know, we're professors. We're architects. We, this, is, this is our image of ourselves. Unfortunately, the public sees us like this. Um, you know, as a collection of crackpots and James Bond villains and the cigarette smoking man who's secret, secretly rigging the Super Bowl behind everybody's back. That's one of my favorite. Um, by the way, I, of course, you know William Dave, uh, Davis here is a Canadian who doesn't smoke, uh, was cast in this role in the X-File. My favorite moment is when he says to a group of men, I don't care what you do about the Oscars, but as long as I'm alive, the Bills never win a Super Bowl. Um, you know, we are these kind of idiotic, difficult to listen to professors. Or worse, we're a bunch of rich guys at Davos, you know, manipulating the global economy uh, to increase our portfolios by a tenth of a percent uh, while putting entire towns out of business. And, and we're not communicating with each other anymore. And society can't function, a, a, an advanced, Post-industrial society cannot function with experts and the public constantly mistrusting each other because this is how experts see the public. This was one, this, everybody in the world sent me this cartoon when it came out about six months ago. Um, if you can't read the 
caption, it's on board an airplane, and this fellow here is saying, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? We can't go on like this. This is not healthy. We, we, are, we rely on a division of labor, both politically and technologically, to make our societies work. And if the experts decide, and I think this is one place where I'm very critical of experts, if the experts decide to simply withdraw from the public space and not come out and do talks like I'm doing right now, I mean, I do talks all over the world. Um, I do a lot of universities and classrooms. Um, a lot of my colleagues don't want to do that. They don't want to get yelled at. They don't want to get shouted at. They don't feel like they need the headache. They would much rather just publish in their journals, talk to each other, because, you know, who wants to be the bad guy? Uh, but that's not going to work. We can't maintain a democracy on aggressive ignorance. And I, I'll just finish by saying there are some significant concerns here that I have about the risks to government and to national security, to our well-being. I don't mean national security like secrets. I mean like the security of our nation, the security of our alliance, the security of the West, um, the public, for, for one thing, is not equipped to mediate among important alternatives anymore. If you have people who think North Korea is in, is in Sri Lanka and that Agrabah is our enemy, uh, you simply cannot rely on the public to give you an intelligent demand signal. And I've gone to a lot of audiences around, particularly around the United States, and said, people have said, Washington doesn't listen to us. And I'm, to which I say, Washington tends to listen to you too much, and the times it doesn't listen to you, thank God for it. Because you don't know what you're telling them. You, you don't know what you're asking yet. Um, oh, by the way, speaking of Washington, this is a good time to say, I certainly don't represent the views of the United States government in any way <laughs> on any of this stuff. Um, this makes propaganda more effective. When people don't know what they're doing, they don't have basic levels of political literacy, Propaganda becomes very powerful uh, because then you're a sucker. You believe whatever you see. Somebody sends you a Facebook meme and you say, okay, I get it. Hillary Clinton's a pornographer. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is um, the Manchurian candidate. Um, Barack Obama is an African prince who was smuggled here as a baby. Um, the Republican, the small r Republican form of democratic government will collapse under the demands of uninformed populism. I, I was watching, um, anybody see a couple of days ago, there was a video of a group of children meeting with Dianne Feinstein about environmental stuff. And it was really, it was an ambush, and Senator Feinstein was standing, little kids were shouting, it's our future, and you know, we're all gonna die, and all this stuff, and Feinstein's standing there going, look, I agree with you, I've, you know, I'm a legislator. But somebody in the room said, your job is to come here and say what we tell you. And I would, on this, I think we all need to go back maybe and read more Edmund Burke. Her job is, Senator Feinstein's job is not to go to Washington and just be a megaphone. She is there like every other representative in a democracy, whether it's your parliament, our Congress, wherever it is. Those representatives have been sent there to exercise their judgment as well as to represent views back home. And that's a conversation. That's a conversation that includes the fact that those elected representatives rely on experts. They cannot be experts in everything. I, I advise the senator, they do childcare in the morning, they do trade in the afternoon, they do nuclear weapons at dinner. They can't possibly master all these things. And if the public says, look, just do what we want at any given moment, we will literally collapse into incoherence. And my biggest fear, um, and I'll end on a you know, somber note because it's first thing in the morning and that way I can bum everybody out for the day. Um, my biggest fear is not that we will collapse into mob rule, but that we will slide, as we already are, into technocracy. That experts will simply say, you know, you know what people really want? They want things to just work. So let's stop asking them what they want and let's just make stuff work. That's not democracy either. It'll keep the lights on, keeps the water flowing, keeps the traffic moving, but that is not democratic behavior. That is not a functioning republic.
That is a technocracy that is providing some basic goods and services in exchange for civic peace. And I don't want us to go down that road either. So I think the average citizen has a much greater responsibility here to be better informed, stop yelling at each other, stop, start being nicer to each other, turn your computers off, turn your televisions off for a while. But I think that experts uh, in the public arena have an obligation to come out and engage and to talk back and to be willing to answer questions and to own our mistakes and to stand for what we think is true and to argue always on the side of facts and reason rather than emotion. Let me stop there. I'd be happy to take your questions. <clears throat> Done? Great. Sorry, I can't see you from there. You go. Thank you. Go ahead. I wanted to stop after I agree with everything you're saying, but the second part of your question is really important. And the question was, what is going to bring us to our senses here? What's going to change this? Um, I, I didn't want to end on this big of a, be a bummer, but my real concern is that um, it will take a disaster. Um, the three things I worry about the most are a pandemic, I mean, what's gonna, the anti-vaccine movement will be over tomorrow if there's a pandemic. And it's already beginning. I mean, measles is already breaking out, whooping cough. Um, but when there's a no kidding, you know, return of widespread injury to children, uh, that will, that'll do it, but that'll be at a very high cost. I mean, I have people, there are people in my living memory who have polo, polio. I have people in my family who live from polio. Um, one of my, but it shows you, again, how comfortable we've become. I was telling my students, I was giving a lecture on um, biological warfare, you know, one of those feel-good holiday get-togethers. And um, I said, well, unlike the rest of you in this room, I've been vaccinated for smallpox uh, as a child because I used to travel, I'm part Greek, and I would travel, I'm part Greek and part Irish. There's a, there's a joke in there somewhere. Um, and uh, I would travel to southern Greece, see my relatives, and I had to get vaccinated for smallpox. And I swear to God, the student said to me, smallpox? Why did they vaccinate you for smallpox? Nobody gets that. <laughs> and I said, duh. And I said, vaccination? Nobody gets that. And you could see for a moment the student suddenly, you know, the kind of the penny dropped. And he went, oh. I said, that's why nobody gets that. Um, so I worry about a pandemic. I worry about a, a no kidding economic depression, not the recession of 2008, where a bunch of people bought houses they couldn't afford, and a bunch of wise guys on Wall Street securitized their debt. I mean a real depression. And finally, the thing I worry about most is war, and a, particularly a war involving nuclear weapons. Um, I, by the way, I do worry about climate change. I think climate change is real, but I also think climate change is more gradual. I think the scientists, you know, in this sense, the public yells at each other a lot, but scientists are doing what scientists do. Um, I worry about things where that can get off the handle right now. A pandemic, a depression, a war. And I think that each of those uh, could be devastating. If you think about the period in which experts were respected more than any other, it was from 1945 to 1985. Why? Because experts were rebuilding a world that had been shattered by two world wars and the emergence of communism in which well over 100 million people had died in one century. I'd kind of like to skip that step in rehabilitating expertise. I'd like to not have to live through that to get back to, to experts being respected. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. In a, in, a, in a world where, thank you. In a world where people are more scared of uh, um, gluten than polio, how do we educate them? Because we're all in a four-year lifespan, basically, because we all run for real election every four years. But we need to educate them to 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 believe our experts. So. 
what's the what's what's the step? I guess. Well, you know, the, how, 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 how do we get the, the buy-in from our public? The, the problem with um, the anti-vaccine movement is that it is not actually concentrated among people who are ignorant. It is concentrated among people who are just educated enough to be a pain in the rear end. Um, you know, that, they're, that these are people who are just affluent and educated enough to have a lot of time to spend on the internet and say, I read an article in The Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and they didn't understand it. Uh, poorer people actually don't have the option of not vaccinating since they use public schools. And in, at least in the United States, most of the public schools simply just require vaccination. The people that are the problem are affluent and educated enough to opt out of the public schools. So again, I don't know how to reason with those people. Um, we've tried reasoning with them. We've tried giving them more information. I have become a big fan of shaming. Um, you know, which is a value that is not in vogue in 21st century North America. But I think uh, when someone says, well, I didn't vaccinate my children, I say, well, shame on you. You're an idiot. And you're endangering other people. You're endangering the lives of other human beings because you are too narcissistic and arrogant to believe something that we know to be true. I also think there's an element of attention seeking in all of this. Um, that, that it's almost like people, in order to be unique, they say, I don't believe in vaccines. Um, the flat earthers are the, I, I, was, I, I, did a, I was part of a segment on CBS last summer about flat earthers, and the one comment they didn't use, because I think they didn't want to offend everybody in the audience, but I, I said, they don't really think the earth is flat, but this is a, this is a wonderful means of attention seeking. You know, like, look at me. I'm, I'm so interesting. I think the world is flat. You know, it makes me unique and interesting, and it makes you talk to me for hours on end. So, um, you know, nobody's going to die because they think the world's flat, unless, except for that guy who keeps trying to launch himself into space on a balloon, and, you know, what are you going to do, right? As long as he falls into a cornfield, I think we're all okay. Um, but, but the anti-vaxxers are really dangerous. Um, and it's spreading in Europe, and, I, and I, I, I'm not quite sure what to do. California, I think, did the right thing of finally saying, you know what, we have a legislature for a reason, uh, and we're just going to make it a law. And I prefer not to do things by law. I am a small government conservative. I don't like mandating lots of things through government coercion, but when it comes to creating herd immunity so that we all don't die of polio or whooping cough or measles, I think I'm okay with that. Thank you. Very nice presentation, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, even though we have experts and they're important to give us the information, we still need to ask the questions to make sure that we have all the information that we can get to make our value judgments. Absolutely. Um, you know, talk to a doctor, uh, for example, and doctors, I, I, I've had bad experiences with doctors. I mean, we all have, right? God, God complex, egomaniacs, unlike professors who are humble. Um, but um, I, I found that by and large, if you ask a doctor a question, and this is always my advice to people when they say, well, how should I interact with an expert? They say, ask a question. We love answering questions. It's what we live for. You know, we become experts. I'm like, we're, ask us anything. We're here. You know, we want people to talk to us. But you talk to a doctor, and the difference, and, and my own physician said this to me. He said, you know, there's a difference between that and come, somebody who comes in and says, uh, yeah, good morning, doc. Listen, so here's what I've got, and here's what you're going to prescribe, and here's what you're going to do. That is not a productive conversation with an expert. And they dig in. They're human beings, too. You know, like, oh, well, screw me. I guess I shouldn't have gone to medical school. I don't know what I was thinking, you know? I, I, I talked to a, a um, I did a lot of interviews for the book, and I talked to a very well-known um, orthopedic surgeon who does sports industry, in, in, excuse me, injuries. And, you know, this is the guy, these guys are at the top of their field, right? I mean, the, the kid who twists a knee on the soccer field kind of guy. And uh, he said, I have gotten to the point where I just want to put all the instruments and medications on a tray and push it across the table and say, you do it. You, that, you, you figured this out? You're that smart? You do it. Now, when you've got a doctor who's that good, who has topped out on people explaining to him how to do complicated reconstructive surgery, something's gone wrong. 
So I, I think it's your job to be educated enough to ask questions and to read a paper. You don't have to go and get a PhD. You don't have to get an MD. Read a newspaper. If I hear one more person tell me, well, you know, I don't have time to keep up on the news. You have time to watch a football game. You have time to hit level 37 on Halo. You have time to do all kinds of things. If you don't, if you don't have time, you know, to read a, new, a national newspaper for 30 minutes in the morning, then, you know, you're the busiest person in the world, or maybe you're lying. <laughs> So that's my advice. Ask questions. Don't make statements. Great presentation. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, ignorance sometimes has the loudest voice. How do you deal with it? Uh, what do we do about that, about ignorance having the loudest voice? Yeah. Uh, well, in the age of social media especially, that's true. Um, and of course, it was even before the age of social media, the expression that, you know, a lie can get all the way around the world before the truth puts its pants on. Um, I think when it comes to, to the amplification of ignorant views, you know, I think of it, maybe this is because of the vaccine thing we were just talking about, I think about it as inoculating yourself against infection with stupidity. If you read a newspaper every day, I always tell my students, if you read a newspaper every day, 99% of the stuff that you're going to read on the internet is going to bounce right off you. If you watch an hour of an, uh, and I don't mean an hour of, you know, Fox or MSNBC or CNN at 10 o'clock. I mean an hour of, you know, the, the evening newscast at 5 or 6 p.m. or listen to the BBC for a half an hour or read the Washington Post for an hour, whatever it is. 90% of all that ignorant yelling and shouting is just going to just bounce right off you because it will just seem silly. Um, I think the, the, the problem with ignorance having the loudest voice is not the volume of their ideas, but the fact that the, um, that the protective clothing that we once had of um, a basic level of political and scientific and civic literacy is gone because we just don't care and we're just too lazy. So we, somebody, we walk by and somebody says, you know, Obama was born in Africa. And we go, all right, maybe he was. You know, we just kind of keep walking. Um, I, I don't think that's healthy. I think some basic civic literacy. Um, I think more and more schools should get away from that therapeutic stuff and get to um, critical thinking and how to evaluate competing arguments. We used to do that. I was taught that way. Um, there, there are ways around it, but you're never going to stop the fact that stupid people are, you know, that the loudest, the biggest chowder head is the loudest guy in the bar. That's just the way it is. One more. So we have, I, think, I think we have time for one more question. But in the back there. So I guess based on what you're saying, do you think democracy's in danger, or is that something that we should be worried about, especially with Russia and China influences? Democracy is in danger, and yes, you should be worried about it. Um, but I don't blame Russia and China. You know, I, Chris, I come from the United States, and I'm constantly being told the Russians, you know, ate the election. Um, I have no doubt that the Russians meddled interfered, attacked, I shouldn't even say meddled. I, I've said, I, in fact, last time I was in Canada, I gave a talk on this, the, the Russians attacked American political institutions directly. But if people, you know the quickest way to defeat the Russians? Don't get your news from Facebook. <laughs> That's it. You want to defeat the, the Russian military intelligence and the FSB and Vladimir Putin? You want to fight the Russians one-on-one, toe-to-toe? -to -toe? Don't get your news from Facebook. It's that simple. It's not their fault if we eat the garbage they're serving us. That, that's been my answer all along. I have no doubt that, Amer that there were Americans who were swayed by Russian propaganda. But that's because they were hanging around you know, in places that were prone to Russian propaganda. It's, always, it's like the argument of people saying, well, of course I'm overweight. You know, as you can see, I work out and am very svelte. Um, 
but you know, it, it, it does bother me when Americans who have become more, we've, the, the United States, people in the United States have become more and more obese over the years. And we say, well, what, what were we gonna do? You know, there's a Burger King on every corner. Well, don't eat there. Like, you know, maybe call me crazy, but you know, they put a McDonald's on every corner. You don't have to stop at every corner. You can keep walking. And, and I think this is, this is just part of a self-discipline and, and an adult approach to the, I, I, I do compare the consumption of information to food. A balanced diet uh, in moderate portions. You know, don't go to the same place every day. Ask about the provenance of the information. If somebody sends you a meme, delete it. Don't, you know, if your Aunt Rose sends you some crazy Facebook thing with, a, you know, like my funny animated cat, it's not, that's not information. And the Russians, I think, have identified, and the Russians in particular have identified a really crucial vulnerability in, in us, in the West, through things like social media and, and cable. I mean, I, I, there, are, there are, I, I will talk to almost any media organization in the world. I will not do interviews with RT. It's that simple. I just don't appear on RT. It's a rule. Um, that's my one little, you know, digging in because I'm not going to send. I t if, whenever I'm on TV, of course I go on Twitter because I'm relentlessly self-promoting. I say, hey, I'll be on, you know, MSNBC tomorrow, or I'll be on CNN tonight. I, I don't, I don't do RT. I just think it's wrong. Um, don't, don't go there. Don't go to those sources. And I don't see why people find this so difficult. Because when they ask about this and they say, what can I do to counter Russian propaganda? It's like saying, what can I do to counter the fact that they're supersizing my fries? Well, stop ordering the supersized fries and stop eating them. Uh, and I, I think that's a very, that's just a matter of self-discipline. And if we can't master it, then yes, democracy in the United States, in Italy, in Canada, France, Germany, all of the leading democracies are going to be in deep, deep trouble until they're voters and their citizens start acting like responsible adults again. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much. That's some very thoughtful and insightful uh, stuff from Tom this morning, and we really, really appreciate him coming in and uh, taking the time to speak with us all uh, this morning. So. So now I am uh, happy to uh, introduce our first shift disturber, and that's Mark Wilson. Mark's a retired Canadian registered safety professional who had a 30-year career in occupational safety as a trainer and a safety program developer. Mark has also been a volunteer firefighter for almost 30 years. He is now the resource manager for the GEMS committee, and GEMS is going the extra mile for safety, and he's based out of Temiskaming Shores, Ontario. GEMS is a volunteer organization which is focused on establishing a 2 plus 1 highway project on Highway 11 in Northern Ontario to reduce serious injuries and fatalities on that section of the Trans-Canada Highway. Please give a warm ogiery welcome to Mark Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just get this to work. Here we are. Yes, our committee, the GEMS committee, is a road safety advocacy group based out of Temiskaming Shores in northeastern Ontario. And we are advocating for a two plus one road pilot project between North Bay and Temiskaming Shores. Our committee has been researching this two plus one road model extensively, and I, on behalf of the committee, have traveled to both Sweden and Ireland to uh, meet with experts and tour two plus one roads. Um, we have also been in communication with the municipalities along our Highway 11 corridor, and we have been seeking support for a resolution for a two plus one road. We have received overwhelming support, and that resolution has led to a, uh, a study done by WSP that is looking at the feasibility of two plus one um, for the Ministry of Transportation. Two plus one roads are a significant reason for the huge success of a Swedish road safety program called Vision Zero. Vision Zero is about designing safe roads for humans 
that make mistakes. It's about focusing on fatalities and serious injuries and less so on minor collisions. The results of Vision Zero are very significant. Sweden is the safest country in the world in which to drive. They have a two point, the, the, their rate of fatalities per 100,000 is 2.5. That's the best in the world. And they've, they've dropped that by over 50% in the last 20 years. So just by comparison, Southern Ontario has a rate of 3.6 fatalities per 100,000 population. Canada is 5.2, and Northern Ontario is eight. We would like to do something about that bottom figure. Before two plus one and vision zero, Sweden had a serious problem on roads like this. Their wide two-lane highways were built on 12 and a half to 13 meter road platforms. These roads had very high fatality and serious injury rates. They had excessive speeds. They had many head-on collisions, and they had a lot of inappropriate passing. So Sweden wanted to do something about this, so, uh, but they also had financial restrictions. So they were looking for a solution that was financially responsible. So they took this road platform and turned it into this road platform. Two lanes on the right, as you see, one lane on the left, divided by a median strip, that contains a physical barrier. In this case, the physical barrier is a wire rope barrier. So this two plus one profile alternates every two to four kilometers and gives drivers on these roads the opportunity to pass about 40% of the time, which is much more than what we have on Highway 11 in Northern Ontario. Um, our, our rates of opportunities for passing are much lower. So after a very successful pilot project in Sweden, where they used the cable barrier style, Sweden continued to build more two plus one roads. They now have over 3,000 kilometers and they're building more all the time. They also have wide acceptance of these roads by the public and that is the same in other countries that now have two plus one roads as well. Over the 20 years that they've built two plus one roads and used them, they've also changed some of the technology and the materials that they use. So this is an example of a barrier that is now standard for their two plus one roads. It's also the standard central barrier in Ireland as well. So it's a, it's a steel barrier. And this is from a picture, or this picture is from a project I visited in June. Uh, and I also visited the manufacturer of the barrier on my trip uh, when I was there in December. Two plus one roads work best at traffic volumes between 2,000 and 20,000 average annual daily traffic. So there are many applications that it could be used here in Canada and Ontario, and certainly this fits the uh, volumes that we have on our northern Ontario highways. So we're gonna take a quick ride on a two plus one road, a little video here. Um, please disregard the date on the bottom. Uh, I didn't set the dash cam properly on this one. Uh, so this is actually June of 2018. So here we go, a little ride on the two plus one road, get it started, oops. It's not working, can we advance that to to get it to move. Technical, <laughs> it's not moving for me. There we go, okay. So you'll notice uh, as we move along, there was a sign indicating that we have a passing opportunity for 1.7 kilometers. And as we're driving along the road, you'll notice on the barrier side, there's a rumble strip, and there's also a rumble strip on the shoulder side. And you'll also notice the reflectors, which are quite common on Swedish roads. You'll notice coming up on the right, there's a farm and a farmhouse. And so for people who live along these roads, they need access to both directions. So what they simply do is they'll drop the barrier, as you see on the left, which gives them access. So there's very little disruption for um, people who live along the roads. You'll also notice the trucks on the road. The trucking industry is in full support of two plus one roads. And I met with trucking officials when I was there. 
Coming up, you'll see signs on both sides of the road indicating that there's a lane drop happening. So on the left lane will disappear shortly in 400 meters, and you'll see the arrows on the asphalt. This is opposite to the way our passing lanes are in Ontario and Canada. And there the lane comes to an end, and we're on a single lane section. And now we come to another intersection, an at-grade intersection, which is quite common with these two plus one roads in certain volumes. A little shot here of winter. Um, this is what it looks like in the winter. They work very well in the winter. This was taken during my trip in December. And uh, this is very close to the Arctic Circle, actually. So there are two plus one roads up there as well. There we go, a little bit of what it feels like. So what are the safety results? The safety results are exceptional. About 80% reduction in fatalities on these two plus one roads in comparison to the wide two lane roads that they originally had. Reduction in motorcycle fatalities, 40 to 50%. This is a very interesting slide too and I think it's one that's very, very important. When we look at the relative risk of dying on different road types. So this is from a Swedish study and it looks at three different road types. We look at the first column, divided highways, posted at 110 kilometers. That's similar to our 400 series highways here in, in Ontario. Let's bounce over to the two lane, 90 kilometer. Uh, so, so, sorry, divided highway, uh, your relative risk of dying is one. Let's bounce over to the two lane, 90 kilometer, and we have a 5.5 risk of dying on that road. Look at the two plus one road, and you see that it's basically the same as a divided highway, actually a little bit better. So for that kind of safety performance, when you, keep, when you take that into consideration, and then this into consideration, that two plus one roads are built at 75% lower cost than twinning, um, it makes a lot of economic sense, as well as a lot of safety sense. Two plus one roads can be built in areas like ours, right? On the left, you've got Sweden. On the right, Northern Ontario. The platform is there. The technology is there. We think that it's something we need to test. Highway 11 is a vital link for all of those, for, sorry, for all of us who live in Northern Ontario. It's a significant, there's significant agricultural and mining expansion occurring now, and that's all serviced by Highway 11. It's the route of choice for cross-country commercial traffic. Citizens fear driving on the highway, and it's our personal and economic lifeline. With many road closures, uh, which happen quite often, uh, that affects both our regional and provincial economies. So as Andrew Petullo, the uh, OGRA founding president said 125 years ago, good roads transform the district through which they pass and lead to higher civilization and enhance commerce. Well, we agree with that 100%. We just need the good road. So I would like to thank you for your attention this morning. Please look us up at our address there. We're part of the Temiskaming Shores and Area Chamber of Commerce. We're a subcommittee of that organization. Uh, my phone number is there as well. So please, if you're interested, please call me. We're more than willing to talk to anyone about two plus one roads and how they can make a difference in Ontario. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Great presentation. Okay. Thanks very much to Mark. Great presentation, especially uh, now that we're talking more and more about Vision Zero, and that's a great example of one of the tools that we can use uh, in that uh, toolbox. So now I am uh, pleased to introduce Marco Mendicino, who is the Member of Parliament for the riding of Eglinton Lawrence. A lawyer and a family man, Mr. Mendicino has dedicated his career to keeping our community safe. As a federal prosecutor for nearly a decade, he fought against organized crime and terrorism. Mr. Mendicino was also the president of a national association representing nearly 3,000 federal prosecutors and Government of Canada lawyers. Prior to being elected a member of parliament, Mr. Mendicino ran his own law practice, focusing on regulatory and labor and employment matters. He was an adjunct professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, a small business owner, and a soccer coach to his daughter's teams. Mr. Mendicino has served as a parliamentary secretary since 2017 
and is currently the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. Please welcome to the OJRA stage for the first time, Marco Mendicino. Thanks, Chris. Well, thanks, Chris, uh, for that kind introduction, and it's great to be here with you at the OGRA. Um, I want to thank Mark, too, who just uh, gave you that talk, and he mentioned Highway 11. And as I have colleagues who work in our caucus, uh, I know how important that road is and how important the work that you're all doing in your respective communities to ensuring that we're better connecting Canadians, and I'm going to speak about that. I also want to thank uh, Tom Nichols. He gave a great talk, didn't he? Um, absolutely. Um, you heard in the introduction that I was a federal prosecutor uh, before I got into elected politics, and I had the opportunity to work on some cases involving national security, and so a lot of the themes that he touched on really resonated with me, and I thought that what he did very effectively was to put into sharp focus some of the, the real challenges, the tangible challenges that we have that we face together, not only in government and politics and municipal life, but when we come to think about the system of democracy. And I will tell you that as somebody, and I'm sure many of you who, who work in your communities day in and day out, we can't take our democracy and our institutions for granted anymore. Um, the challenges are real. You know, whether we're talking about the proliferation of hate or populism that is uh, counterproductive or toxic, uh, whether we're talking about the kinds of threats that we see online, we have to be very clear-eyed. We've got to be very sober about what it is that's out there and the work that we're trying to do. And I thought that you know, Tom uh, really helped us understand why it is that we're putting in the work that we are every day. And you know, he mentioned Edmund Burke who's a philosopher going back a few years now. Uh, thanks to him and to Tom for reminding us all that the world is not flat, that it's round. And that's a good metaphor for reminding us about the value that we have to place in evidence, in science, in data, in the work that you do, the research that you do as planners, as engineers. I mean, these are really the big themes that I hope that you're all talking about at this conference. Because if we adhere to those basic principles, then not only are we going to build good roads and build good communities and build good infrastructure, which I will get into, uh, that I, don't want to, I want to be sure that the, the good department folks who prepared this speech don't feel like they didn't do it for no reason at all, but that we protect our democracy, that we protect Canada. Because that's why I got into politics, and I'm sure that's why so many of you are so passionate and have such a great love for this country. I'm honored to join you at this conference and to, make, to help mark the 125th anniversary of this organization. I want to congratulate all of you who work through the OGRA on behalf of your communities. For 125 years, the OGRA has championed the transportation and public works of Ontario municipalities. You've advocated for leadership in the management of Ontario infrastructure, and you've established partnerships to deliver essential services to Ontario residents. The work that you do connects Ontarians to their communities, and it makes their lives better. I also know in a very specific way that the work of the OGRA has seen some additional policy work in the area of asset management and bundling, and I want to commend you for that work. That is work that our government values. As the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, I'm pleased to speak to you today about how our government's investments in our country's public infrastructure, including our roads and highways, is benefiting all Canadians. Now, some of you may have heard of our long-term infrastructure plan. It is called the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Plan, and it involves an over $180 billion investment over the next 12 years. How are we going to deliver on, on that promise? Through coming to an agreement with the provinces and the territories, and ultimately those bilateral agreements, which are all now signed with each and every province, including right here in our home province of Ontario, is about promoting communication, dialogue, and partnership across every level of government. Because as you will know, 
that to build, to enhance our infrastructure, we need cooperation. We need to be working together. And no, at no point in time has that been more important than right now. Now, how are we doing? Are we actually making some progress? I would submit to you that we are. And what is the proof of that pro process? Well, more than 33,500 projects have already been approved to date, and nearly all of them are already in progress or completed. Just to give you a few highlights, to date, across the country, our investments have supported the purchase of more than 3,000 new transit vehicles, the upgrade and construction of nearly 15,000 bus stops and shelters, the repair of construction of more than 1,200 clean water and wastewater systems, the renewal of more than 2,000 kilometers of roads and highways, and the construction of more than 170 kilometers of new highway. These investments are improving the quality of life of Ontarians and strengthening our communities. I'm talking about investments that will result in cleaner and safer water for people to drink. And here, I would point out that we have reduced by a number of 78 the water advisories that we often see in our Indigenous communities, and that is work that has to continue. Safer roads and highways that make it easier for Ontario businesses to move their goods to market, better roads that connect rural Ontarians to other parts of the provinces, province and beyond, faster, more reliable internet services for Ontarians living in rural and northern communities to connect them to the world. And again, we're not just talking about shopping online. We're talking about access to health and education and other essential services which ensure that Ontarians can live a high quality of life and are connected. The best infrastructure boosts trade and drives innovation, which creates good paying jobs today and prepares Canadians for the jobs of the future. The best infrastructure also attracts more talent and investment to our communities, which will create new jobs and business opportunities for Ontarians. Our investments will allow Canadians the opportunity to participate fully in the economy and share in its prosperity. Our government is doing our part to position Canada for the 21st century, but we cannot do it alone. Partnerships with organizations like the OGRA are the key to Canada's success. You know your communities, you know what is best for them, and that is why we are here to partner with you. Through your advocacy, your consultation, your training and your expertise and the services you deliver, we are ensuring that we have better policies and legislation and investments which are required. In fact, the role of partnerships is an important way for the public sector to deliver more quality infrastructure for Canadians. And that's why our infrastructure plan is designed to expand the opportunities for the public sector public sector to attract private sector investment, both domestically and globally. And it's why we created the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Now this is a new bank. It's a new bank that will ensure that we are stretching public dollars and that the return on their investment goes further. It attracts private investment to free up government resources for other infrastructure priorities. The Canada Infrastructure Bank really operates like a bank. Over the past year, the CIB has met with provincial, territorial, municipal, and Indigenous leaders and with private sector proponents and is working with them to identify a pipeline of potential projects and investment opportunities. Through its work, the bank is advancing new models of partnership that get more projects built. As you may have heard, the CIB's first investment is in Montreal for the Rezo Express Metropolitan. The REM, as it is sometimes called, is a single integrated transportation network that will offer more efficient travel options for the residents of Montreal. The CIB is also playing an advisory role and in providing information and expertise on private sector or institutional investment in public infrastructure projects. I encourage you to explore potential partnerships with the CIB. Take advantage of their expertise as you continue to plan your large-scale infrastructure projects. Another one of our government's priorities is to ensure that Canadians living in rural areas
have access to the same quality of broadband connectivity as our urban regions, as I have already mentioned. And here I'm referring to two main initiatives. One, the Connect to Innovate Fund, which is being administered by Minister Baines under the portfolio of ISCD and our SWIFT program. And we will continue to make investments to extend access to rural households and businesses. And there is still more to do. That's why our government is committed to taking additional action on rural broadband. Bernadette Jordan, Canada's newly appointed Minister of Rural Economic Development, has made access to high-speed internet and wireless service a key focus of her discussion with rural leaders, and I know she looks forward to coming to your communities in the very near future. My friends, I want to emphasize the magnitude of the opportunity that we have. Our government's investments in public infrastructure are ensuring that your communities are safer and healthier, more accessible and sustainable, and so that each and every one of us can enjoy more economic opportunity and a higher quality of life. Our government is ready to be a strong partner in your growth, and I look forward to working with you to make that growth happen as we build a stronger and more prosperous Canada. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thanks, Marshall. Thanks very much. That was great. Thank you very much, Mark. And we always appreciate uh, the partnerships we can have with the federal government and uh, the support from Parliament. So, well, that concludes our morning session. Um, so we're pleased. Uh, we have about uh, just over half an hour for you to enjoy coffee. Uh, the coffee stations are set up in the exhibitor hall. So uh, please take some time to visit with our exhibitors, have a cup of coffee. And the concurrent workshops will start at 11 o'clock. And you can refer to your program to the conference app for the topics and the locations of those uh, workshops. And then the afternoon will start back here in this room at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. Have a great day.